Welcome back 2021ers. This will be our last presentation of virtual memory. A few logistics items to get started. I'll be posting the Project 5 later on this evening. It'll be due a week from now. So make sure to have a look at it. It'll be shorter, just a single problem that will employ some concepts we're learning now about memory mapping and a few items that we'll touch on in the next lecture or so that have to do with the ELF file format. Our goals today are just to finish out this discussion of virtual memory by discussing one aspect of it, which is the ability to share code uh, or data between multiple processes. This will motivate us a little bit to our, our next topic, which discusses the process of linking multiple compiled files together in order to produce executables. And we'll see that one spot that the virtual memory system can serve us in that is to give programs the ability to share instances of library code like printf and malloc and so forth. Uh, one other logistics uh, announcement associated with uh, this uh, course, you'd want to make sure to mark your calendar for the final exam date, which uh, is on Wednesday, the 13th of May. It is unfortunately the last day of the final exam period, so we'll have to wait, but that should give folks some time to wrap their other classes up and adequate time to prepare. This is a little bit of a change for folks who are in the morning section as we had originally been slated to have a final exam there at a different time. So check your schedule, and if you happen to have conflicts, please do email me and we'll work out arrangements for you to take the exam at an applicable time. If you're one of the unfortunate few that have uh, three or more finals on any of those days, uh, Wednesday the 13th in particular, then I can certainly work with you to take the 2021 exam at an alternate time. We left off last time having discussed this nmap utility, which is an ask to the operating system to directly manipulate the memory map and page table associated with the program uh, to plop things down in that memory image. The first use that we saw for this was associated with taking files that the operating system usually holds in memory itself and asking that the program receive direct access through pointers to it. And this created some interesting capabilities such as uh, monitoring uh, files that are either textual or binary uh, or making changes to them as though they were in-memory data structures that were allocated in the C program. In truth, this ask to the operating system is just to map it into space that the OS preserves associated with the file so that changes that you would make or things that you would observe about the file are coming directly uh, from or to the file itself. Uh, this had some big upsides in that you were able to cut out the middleman, uh, middle area of memory of copying stuff from OS space into your program space and back and forth. But it did have the minor drawback then uh, that this does not track file sizes and must map at the page level because uh, memory mapping works with the page table, which always does things in these 4K size chunks. That has a few spots where it's not necessarily applicable, but there are wide areas where memory mapping files and other kinds of data uh, is used. We'll finish out today uh, with a reminder that you have a page table per process. And so we looked at some images earlier on in this discussion, and I think it's worthwhile to sort of uh, pull those images back up, where you would see a bunch of running processes. These are programs that have been loaded into memory, and each of them has their own page table data structure that indicates in the virtual space that those programs have, where does the data associated with the program actually physically reside? And the operating system, along with the hardware elements like the MMU, will perform this translation on the fly for the programs. This creates an interesting scenario in which uh, processes A and B tend not to share very much. Uh, as in, if you looked at their page table uh, and their virtual memory image, uh, a lot of the stuff in here would be stinked. On the other hand, anything that is duplicate of each other could potentially be shared. And so you'll notice here that both these processes and their tiny little page table here at page number 05x, uh, which is mapped to physical page 07. Uh, in both these processes, there exists this little uh, smiley face uh, that is winking. Now, this is uh, a little bit interesting in that this was originally what we were trying to avoid is having two processes with uh, memory that they see and think of as their own actually coinciding in physical space and therefore changes A would make to it uh, would be seen by B. 
there are some cases in which this is potentially useful. Uh, so this image of processes owning address zero up to big, uh, this very large sort of virtual address space and it being unique and solely touchable by, by the process. Uh, there actually are some spots where you'd want process to be able to collaborate in some way. Uh, so sharing would be good. Generally, this isn't the default because programs should work in isolation and not affect each other. There is one spot where it becomes very safe in order for code to be shared between these two processes. And it's the case in which neither process A nor process B is gonna change what's at this memory address. Uh, so for instance, uh, all things being equal, process A, if it plopped down a little frown over here, process B would see that because it's directed to the same spot in physical memory over here. Uh, however, if neither process A nor B were going to change this stuff over here, both could use it, read it, print it, etc. Uh, without having to interfere with each other. A common spot where this happens is through the use of library functions where the code associated with that library function itself uh, isn't ever going to change. Uh, you have all written programs that use printf. You've written lots of well, programs that use printf. Comes from the standard C library. Many, many programs that would be running on a Unix instance uh, would be making use of printf. In this traditional model, uh, every program that wanted to use printf had to have a copy of the printf code embedded in the program. But with this sharing facility, it would be possible for process A and process B, through their virtual memory map and the page table, to both have the same physical location sort of mapped into their memory image for the code for printf. Since the tendency for programs is only to use and call functions, not to actually change their uh, instruction sets. Uh, this is one potential area that you could get space savings and leads to the idea of dynamically linked and shared libraries. Now uh, this calls for you to understand a couple things. Uh, first that we've studied there's a difference between the code associated with printf and the data that it manipulates. Uh, and this is uh, sort of hearkening back to those four main areas of memory that as you would call printf as a function, you would be executing code that's in a text area uh, that comprise, is comprised of the binary versions of those assembly instructions. But in order to pass arguments to printf, uh, you would put things in registers or on the stack associated with it. And it might actually use some heap memory as well. But these are distinct different areas of memory. The one, the text area, is meant for executing. And the others, the stack and the heap, are meant for reading and writing to. Uh, so to that end, this is a juicy target, if we can arrange for it, so that code to be executed by functions uh, could be shared effectively, more so than data that they would manipulate. So uh, this is going to be facilitated then uh, by several different processes having their virtual pages map to the same physical page. And the note here from your textbook author's diagram is that read-only library code, such as the binary executable instructions associated with printf or malloc or a wide variety of other uh, system library functions, uh, these are ripe for uh, sharing between multiple processes. Uh, it is the case that you can have so-called shared memory, uh, which isn't uh, meant to be executed necessarily, but is instead meant for two processes to collaborate on, actually changing the data there. This is a topic that you would address in later classes, uh, such as operating systems, uh, CSI 4061, for instance, where you'd have uh, this want for multiple processes to collaborate in their pursuit of some computation. Uh, having some area of memory that is shareable in that way is uh, uh, useful in getting that off the ground. But for the moment, we're going to restrict our attention uh, to this idea of sharing libraries. We'll pick up on that later on as well as we discuss uh, the executable and linkable format. I mentioned this uh, business of shared memory calls, and there's just a few tidbits associated with this in here. This is forward looking, and so if you want to fast forward through our 30 second discussion of this, uh, feel free to do so. But the details of this will be discussed in, for instance, a CSI 4061 offering. Uh, you'll notice through here, uh, there are a couple things that might be unfamiliar. Uh, we talked uh, at times about this notion of a file descriptor that's associated with files in Unix. That's something that you would spend quite 
quite a bit of time discussing in a 4061 systems programming class, for instance. And this F truncate business is how you can make changes to the size of some file area associated with this file descriptor. But here is one of uh, the, the sort of elements that we've discussed associated with the virtual memory system uh, that should be becoming familiar to you, this MMAP business. And it should come no, as no surprise that if you want to be able to share a member with folks, this will involve a manipulation of the page table. Uh, and MMAP is the system call that's most widely used on Unix systems to enable this. In this case, the setup over here is not to create a file of any sort, uh, but instead to make use of a so-called shared memory uh, setup through POSIX system calls. Uh, these have associated with them some global name that sort of looks like a file but isn't really. Uh, at any rate, uh, this won't correspond to a file but will behave very much like uh, a shared file where uh, as multiple programs would map it into their memory image, uh, they could make changes to this piece of memory as though it were an array or a giant struct of some type, and any other program that attaches this piece of memory would also see this. This will be demonstrated in your later classes, hopefully, uh, as it's a useful technique to get processes to collaborate. But I'll digress on it uh, for the moment. All we'll use it for uh, this MMAP in this class is to memory map files for ease of processing. So then, uh, to the point of this uh, mapping of shared libraries and shared stuff in here, uh, I'd like to take a moment to dive, sort of dive into this diagram uh, responsible for uh, computer science professor Wolf Holtzman. Uh, he's the one that put this together. It has a sort of wealth of detail that's in here that uh, can at times be a little bit difficult to see, uh, especially if you have low-res monitor and my video isn't coming at a high resolution. So I'm just going to bop out of the slide for a minute so I can zoom in at some spots. The first thing I want to point out are the macroscopic features, that here is this big sort of layout of memory as uh, a big giant array array, as we've discussed it more or less since the beginning of the semester. And some of the larger features on here you should be familiar with, that there's the mention of a stack, uh, of a data segment that's associated with global variables, uh, and as a, of a text segment. If you look a little closer, uh, you'll see here mentioned the heap or the malloc arena, sometimes called the free store. Uh, this is the area where malloc would do its business. Uh, a few other details on this point um, that uh, come to light if you look closer, uh, you'll see up here uh, that there's this area that's available for stack growth uh, and at the top of the stack is a pointer that keeps track of this location of stack growth. We've come to know this as a stack pointer and in most computer architectures there's usually a special register the, the stack pointer that is devoted entirely to this task because a lot of what computers do is grow the stack and shrink it as functions are called and so forth. There's also a notion of something called a Burke, uh, Burke point here. Uh, and you'll see references to a system call uh, called sBurke uh, that allows you to grow the heap. The stack tends to grow from a high address to a low address. And you can see up here a mention of a high to low. And this is why as we worked on memory images from the beginning of the class, uh, in most modern architectures, Intel uh, prominent among them, uh, memory addresses in the stack grow from high to low. So as you push more global vari or, uh, local variables for functions on, uh, they appear at lower addresses than earlier functions that were called. Uh, versus the heap probably starts at some place and oftentimes grows from a low address to a high address. And you'll notice down here, this is a low memory area. Exact, exactly the arrangement of memory that we've discussed uh, since early on in the class, where the lowest stuff, the stuff that appears at uh, the earliest memory addresses, uh, is the text. Uh, what's in here are a combination of dot O's uh, that we will discuss as we go into uh, the linking discussion. Uh, the formal manifestation of this is code associated with your main function is present here as a binary version uh, of the assembly uh, that the assembler has produced. Uh, and if you're compiling several different files together, several different not O's that you wrote, uh, then the contents of those are merged together and appear in the text section, uh, closely crammed together. Uh, to some extent, then, uh, there might be some library functions uh, that have their own .os uh, that are copied in here. Uh, and uh, I should mention also that there is a spot associated with things like string constants. So anytime you would print a constant string, there's going to be a spot that has to exist in the memory image of your program, usually in the global memory, although it doesn't have a name. Uh, these string constants are important, have to be stored in the memory image of the program, both on disk and as it gets loaded in the running program. 
Uh, so then finally, there's this little nook that's in between the stack and the heap. And the placement of this is somewhat arbitrary. It may vary somewhat, but the most common spot on most Linux implementations is in between the stack and uh, the heaps area over here. And this is so-called shared memory, uh, where as you would mmap things in various ways, uh, this is where mmap tends to default to doing its business. Although if you look carefully at this week's homework, you'll see an instance where you can ask uh, mmap to put some memory that it's mapping in a specific location uh, that isn't this default spot. Uh, what you'll see here is a mention of some of these shared libraries. Uh, so it's not the case that a typical program would have both a malloc.o, uh, the binary code associated with malloc in its text area, and a copy of it here. Programs tend to be either statically linked or dynamically linked, uh, and we'll come to understand what that means as we discuss uh, this linking process. But you'd either see a malloc down here with a statically linked and is in this program is self-contained and has a copy of its own uh, malloc, or it's dynamically linked. So when it is loaded up into this shared area, uh, there's a mapping of where malloc is at. Now this picture is a little bit disingenuous uh, in that what it's sort of pointing out to some extent is locations of stuff within this. Uh, but what we're missing is the picture we had earlier of how this is the virtual memory area associated with the program. So you can think then of this other picture that we discussed in which you have this sort of arrangement of a program thing it has a low to a high memory area and various spots in RAM point to arbitrary physical locations over here. And so this uh, low area in RAM might be associated with a, the heap and the higher area in RAM might be associated with uh, the stack associated with the program. Uh, but in uh, truth, these are out of order in actual RAM over here. Uh, and importantly, uh, this particular area over here, D, might in fact be associated with a shared library uh, where this has been mapped uh, to page one of this process 456. And you can see if you chase this pointer up here, that goes to uh, RAM location three. Uh, and so too down here, uh, this shared area that uh, is up here at physical location three, it's mapped to the middle of the memory image for process 789. These two are sharing that spot. And so uh, despite this appearing sort of in the middle of a program, it could be an arbitrary physical spot, which is good. Uh, that means that as the first program is going to request that it make use of something like printf, the operating system can load this up at a physical location. And every other program that comes online that wants to make use of malloc and printf can be mapped to that same physical location uh, from some points in virtual memory space uh, that the operating system and the loader find useful associated with it. There are a few other things that are expressed in this picture that are worth reviewing. Uh, for instance, uh, discussion of the layout of arguments on the stack associated with certain architectures. We won't go into that, but if you're curious, uh, feel free to read into this in some more detail or visit the original uh, source for it uh, to check scope out what's going on there. For a moment then, uh, this is a picture, is a reminder of what the virtual memory layout of a typical program is. Uh, this is somewhat of an artifact in that Folks chose at some early stage that text, uh, the program code will appear first, global variables will appear uh, sort of above that. It's because these tend to not have much growth. And the two things that grow, the stack and the heap, uh, they tend to be then something that you start the heap immediately after the global area and the stack at a high area. Uh, as they grow together, then one or the other might be exhausted. In modern implementations, the address space associated with 64-bit systems is so big that you tend not to have stacks sort of interfering with heap, but you can sort of, in most cases, configure uh, programs as they run to have a limited size to the stack to ensure if you hit a stack overflow uh, that you bail out before consuming all the memory that's on the system. So it tends to be the case that uh, stuff that you're not supposed to touch or manipulate, uh, such as the text associated with shared libraries, uh, that bounds the stack in some way and trying to grow into it will trigger uh, what most systems see as a stack overflow. All right, so then the central notion of the shared libraries business is a program uh, that is running called process one and a program that's running a process two. They have their own stack and heap in virtual space. And this will be mapped to separate locations uh, in the uh, sort of physical memory associated with the program. But anything that they can share, such as malloc and printf and so forth, uh, this can appear at a shared physical location because neither process one nor process two is gonna change the code associated with malloc or printf. So they can 
share and simultaneously execute the instructions there. It's essentially read only access and execute only access. Uh, if somehow process one were to gain the ability to change what's on this shared page, they could actually manipulate what the whole system sees as the definition of printf, usually the operating system for business using a permissions mechanism that we'll see uh, very quickly. So I want to talk for a few minutes about this very interesting utility called PMAP. This shows up in our homework this week, and you'll want to spend some time getting acquainted with it. A brief overview appears here on this slide, and then we'll dive into some of the code associated with this in just a second. The main facility of PMAP is to provide the virtual memory space associated with a running program. Uh, and so what you'll see here is a program that we run called Memory Parts. And it could be any program. It's one that happens to be oriented towards easy inspection and comparison. Uh, and what you'll see then in memory parts is that uh, it prints out various addresses of things. Uh, there's a global uh, array, there's a local array that's in the stack, there's a malloc array and an mmapped file, uh, various things in there, and we'll, we'll get a more detailed list of that in a second. All that's done there is to print out uh, the starting address for this malloc array, the starting address for this local and global array, uh, the pointer that's returned by mmap uh, that indicates uh, where this mmapping business is happening. These are printed out as pointer values, so they're displayed in their full sort of 64-bit glory there. Uh, all along with that, then, uh, the process prints its uh, process ID. This is a unique identifier that Unix systems associate with any pro uh, running program. In order to make it easier to see what's going on, uh, the program then pauses. It just waits for someone to punch a key in order to see what's going on. This enables you in a separate terminal to open up uh, and ask using PMAP, show me what the virtual memory associated with this running program is. And this is shown over here in a long listing of the pages in virtual memory, at least, uh, that are mapped for this program, along with their sizes and various other information over here. To make this a little more real, let me jump over uh, to some code that we can use for this. And for that, I'll change into our homework 13 uh, directory. Uh, and in here, uh, there's this provided memory parts code. Uh, you can pull it open and see it has a fairly uh, a sort of simple uh, kind of structure. Here's a global array and a global variable. Uh, there's a local array that's going to be on the stack frame associated with uh, this uh, main function and a malloc array that we store, uh, obtain via malloc and then store in this pointer uh, malloc r. Uh, we'll also go through and do a few things that we did with mmap before. For instance, we can memory map a file. There happens to be a text file called gettysburg.ta in here uh, using the same setup we did with the uh, f stack to get sizes and the file descriptor and so forth. We'll mmap that in. We'll do one other semi-interesting thing in here, which is to mmap some space that isn't associated with a file. Uh, this isn't hard to pull off. Uh, it just is a call to mmap uh, that doesn't have a file descriptor associated with it. Uh, and over here, uh, the minus one rather than a file descriptor, and you can see this FD up here that was obtained by opening Gettysburg. Passing a minus one in here, just ask operating system to uh, map this stuff in as memory that I could do arbitrary stuff with. Uh, to that end, it's not important that it have any file script associated with it. It's just uh, give me permission to touch some memory, and it happens to be both read and write permission. You can see I did some one other interesting thing here, which is to establish a fixed address and make the request to the operating system, please uh, memory map the memory down here in at that particular memory address. And so this address over here is passed into the first thing. Uh, the size associated with this, which is, uh, well, I'm not going to able to do my base 16, but of uh, some size here that's specified in uh, hexadecimal. Uh, it's probably one, uh, oh, what is it? Is this going to be one page? Yeah, I think it's uh, one uh, 4,096 bytes here. Uh, so that's mapped in, and then uh, I map a block immediately after that. Uh, this in the address I specified up here, the 00606 uh, business, uh, and add on to that whatever this size is. Uh, so we'll see the effects of that uh, presently. If I jump over here uh, to a shell, and just uh, sort of compile this with the provided make file, I'll run memory parts. Uh, and then I'll need a second shell because this thing is paused. Let's 
go to here. Uh, so you can see over here uh, the memory address of where various things are present or printed. And this includes uh, the memory address for the main function. Uh, as you would do that in code, uh, let me jump over here just to see, show you that. Uh, the memory address here for main is printed just by using the bare name main. Uh, as I discussed in the little tutorial on function pointers, this in most systems translates to the starting address for the code associated with main. So functions as pointer values just translate to where in memory does the function code actually start. Uh, you can see the addresses for various other things are, are printed out over here, including this uh, anonymously mapped uh, block of memory, uh, where you can see that the address that I requested over here, uh, which starts in a six or so, uh, this is also printed, or this is uh, something that the OS gave me, uh, more or less. It's not guaranteed that when you ask for a specific address uh, that it can be mapped, but this is a safe bet, at least in my practical experience. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, it resides between two major areas that uh, the system System tends to use. All right, so then the point here was to illustrate this uh, PMAP utility. So let me pull that up uh, over here in this shell. Uh, if I call PMAP here, I need to provide it a process ID. And this one reports its process ID as 22024. Uh, knowing about process IDs is handy, particularly if you have misbehaving programs that allows you to kill them uh, effectively. More on that in operating systems class. So running this thing uh, provides a table of values. And what you can see over here then uh, is the sort of entire virtual address space that is mapped according to the operating system page tables associated with this program. We talked about the page table as this data structure that translates the virtual addresses that a program uses to physical addresses. We're seeing one half of that here. As in on the left-hand side are all of the virtual addresses that appear in the page table. To work backwards uh, to some of the diagrams that we have observed earlier, uh, this picture is indicative of it. Uh, so uh, more or less what we're seeing in the PMAP output over here are all of the addresses over here that in a table-like representation wouldn't have nulls associated with them. If I were to call PMAP on this process that's running here that has these three pages mapped, what I would expect to see is a virtual page 00010, that's mapped, uh, virtual page 11100, and virtual page 11110. Uh, those three pages are mapped. Anything that isn't mapped someplace that has these nulls associated with it, uh, they would not show up. So the PMAP for this program would print out uh, three, in, uh, three table entries. Uh, as in, I have 20 or odd so uh, entries here, I'd see only three for that small program. Uh, now, in truth, we talked about this page table not being represented by a physical table uh, in memory that's like a big array, but more as a tree. And so what PMAP will do is traverse this tree and find all of the non-null links here, for, such as this one down here, and report the virtual addresses associated with them. With the right coercion, you could probably write a program that would give you the other half of this, uh, that would indicate the physical location associated with where this virtual address in the program maps. To do so, though, you would probably need administrator privileges on a Unix system, as this is considered privileged info that uh, would be dangerous to reveal what is the physical location uh, of this to arbitrary other stuff. Uh, and so to that end, it's not surprising that a utility like this doesn't automatically print out a physical location that would reveal kernel activities and potentially be a security risk. But at least we get half of this and can understand a few things about the process image and relate it to the uh, diagrams that we've seen uh, earlier. Now what you'll want to uh, have a look at here is that this table is numbered from a low addresses to high addresses. Uh, and you can see uh, down over here uh, that these low addresses starting with 55C and so forth, uh, they work their way up. There's an entry for uh, 0006, uh, some 7Fs and so forth, uh, and up to 7FDs, 7FFs and so forth. Some of these things are labeled and others are not. So let's have a look and see if we can relate any of the parts of the program uh, to what we see over here in terms of addresses. One of the first things that you'll probably notice uh, is that over here, this address for main is listed, it's fairly low at a 55C2235F3, uh, et cetera. Uh, so to that end, uh, this is low in terms of the main addresses that you list out here, because as we looked at pictures uh, previously, uh, such as this somewhat detailed diagram, the text section tends to appear at a low memory address. 
you know, be forgiven if you get a little confused because in this picture, low memory addresses appear at the bottom and high memory addresses appear at the top. The PMAP output reverses that. So low memory addresses appear up at the top with low numbers like 0055 and high memory addresses appear higher up with uh, seven FFs. This is something that will vary somewhat from system to system, uh, but it should be said that this low address isn't anywhere near zero. Uh, and this explains very much then uh, why, since there is nothing that starts with anything lower than 5.5 here, and certainly nothing that is mapping uh, the page zero up here, that's way out of bounds. And any attempts to access like a null pointer that maps to memory address zero are going to lead to out of bounds memory accesses uh, and page faults uh, resulting in the death of the program. But if you look carefully uh, at this address, 55C223, 55C223, F300, uh, this ends in F301E9. And so this would be the exact page that's of memory uh, that main exists on. There are a couple of things, interesting th aspects of this. Uh, first, you can see that the minimum size that's displayed for any of these uh, mappings is four kilobytes. And this is on account of the page table works in page size chunks. So the smallest thing you'll see on here is one page that is mapped from a virtual page address to a physical page address uh, that comes in 4,096 byte chunks. And so that's the smallest thing that you'd see here on most systems. We discussed this uh, page size business as something that is configurable. And so ostensibly on some interesting systems, you might see larger pages, but I would doubt highly uh, seeing something, anything smaller than 4K. Another interesting aspect of this table is you'll see over here uh, a listing of permissions associated with me this memory. Uh, the Unix system adopts a similar set of semantics for memory pages as it does for files, and that some files you have read access to but can't do anything else with them. You could look at what's in them, but you couldn't run them as code and you couldn't change them through writing new data to them. Other spots in memory, other programs, for instance, are actually readable and executable. You don't plan to change the program ever, but you do want to run it, as in feed it to the processor as instructions that are to be executed. And so too here, you'll see the memory page is marked as executable. This makes a lot of sense because main itself is an executable entity. It's comprised at this address of a sequence of bytes opcodes uh, that indicate what assembly instructions the processor should execute. It makes sense then to mark this page of memory as executable, as in what's there is stuff that I want to feed to the processor directly so that it can run stuff. Uh, then you'll also see in this rightmost column here, some entity that the OS has identified with uh, this page in memory. Some of these things have to do with uh, readily identifiable stuff, uh, memory parts in this case, uh, the program that we're running, but others are more anonymously mapped or are associated with other stuff uh, that we'll get to very shortly. So the next item uh, in terms of the program output over here uh, is this global R. Uh, it similarly has a 55C223, F330, uh, and the difference here being with this digit zero and this being three, we're probably on a different page of memory. So I'd have to scan ahead here uh, for this uh, from the F30 up to the F33 here. And here you'll find something fairly interesting uh, that this is again a fairly small page, uh, just one page of memory, but it's marked not read execute, but read write. This makes sense that a global array, uh, that if I pull up the C code for this thing over here, um, the global array that's mentioned up here, this is not marked as constant or anything, so it should be readable and writable uh, by the program. If I tick this up just a little bit and made it a little bit bigger, I uh, could potentially uh, work my way into a second page of memory. And you can see the fact that this occupies a whole page of memory means that in order to fit this other global variable here, uh, this 4096 bytes occupies a whole page, I have to allocate a whole other page for this uh, single uh, double that's over here. And that's very likely uh, one of these other pages that's on marked RW over here. So uh, to that end, uh, if I shrunk this thing down a little bit, it might be possible uh, to fit this set of global data uh, in a single page instead. Uh, on that front then, uh, there are a few other spots to look. Uh, and I wanna emphasize again, uh, the, te the text is marked for readable and executable. Uh, the global memory here is marked as readable and writable. Uh, and if we turn our attention back to this detailed picture, uh, close to text, as in next going higher in memory addresses is where your global variables would tend to reside. 
Uh, so the next uh, thing that shows up in the output over here uh, that might be worth looking at uh, is this local R. Uh, and if you look down just a little ways, this is associated with a stack variable that only exists while the main function is running. Uh, it's this local R business. Its address starts with a 7FFED, and this is a big jump in terms of memory. Uh, we're going from some of the lowest stuff, uh, starting five fives, to some of the highest stuff, starting with S7FFED, etc. So if you jump down here, 7FFEDD, uh, this is maybe a little too far, it's a 9-3. So back up a little bit, and here's this 7FFEDD 9-1. Uh, 9-D would be too far, but 9... Uh, let's see, 9.3 right here. Uh, that seems to be in between it. So it'll be on this page of memory. And this is uh, quite a bit of memory, actually. It's not just a single page, but 132 kilobytes uh, divided by four. What is that? Uh, you know, I'm not gonna not gonna get it. Actually, it's kind of a weird size uh, for it. Uh, that is probably uh, not an even power. So it's like 128k plus one more page. Um, so the stack here is marked very curly then as read and write. This makes sense because any of the data that's in the stack, this local array over here, uh, you want to make changes to, to, to it, uh, to read its contents and potentially put values down in it. Uh, importantly then, it's also something that's not marked as executable. And so none of the code that exists in the stack can be run as executable instructions. Any attempt to do so uh, would lead to mishaps. Uh, so then there are some things that are in between those two, uh, the early sort of uh, global text and global uh, variables and the much later and higher memory area over here associated with the stack. Uh, things in between it might be, for instance, the heap. And you'll see the address here from malloc. Uh, it starts with ox55c, uh, similar to these others, uh, but it is at 224, so it's somewhat higher. Uh, let's see if we can find that, ox5c224, uh, that's here. Uh, and it's marked also as read writes starting at 132 kilobytes. Uh, this is then in between the global area and the stack. And if we turn back our attention, this makes sense with respect to this other stuff. Uh, the heap down is closer to the global variables than it is to the top of the stack uh, typically. Uh, and in between it are the things that we're about to talk about that this shared memory business. Uh, the heap is stuff that you want to be able to change as well. So this array down here, that's malloc, uh, and the, whose address we're uh, keying on to give us some insight into where the heap exists in this. Uh, it is marked also as read-write. Uh, so here, for instance, uh, and uh, that's important because you'd want to be able to make changes to heap data as uh, uh, you would allocate it. Uh, change the numbers that are in there, um, add, subtract, uh, otherwise modify uh, the data structures that are present in the heap. Now, let's look at a few of the other things that are in here. I think one thing that sticks out uh, as a sort of sore thumb, because it doesn't follow the same pattern as the rest of these, uh, is this MMAP space, uh, which is marked here as starting at uh, the 00006 address. Uh, and this is gotten down here by the express request uh, from MMAP, please map into my memory image this page. This is the virtual address that I wanted to be at, and I was met with a success here. Now you can see that this thing is marked as 8K big. Uh, that's on account of the first ask here for MMAP. Uh, it was an ask for a size of uh, 1000 in hexadecimal, that's one or four kilobytes of space. That's a single page. Uh, and I do so again, but uh, uh, same size, just this time offset from the original address. So what you think of then is that this is two pages of memory. Uh, let me see if I can find uh, a picture associated with this thing here. Uh, so this would be like, uh, I guess I don't have a good picture here for it, uh, but it'd be more or less like page one followed by page two. Uh, the way that PMATCH reports this is if both those things are in RAM at the moment, uh, then they're both mapped. And this is essentially one block that starts at a particular virtual address and goes for not one, but two pages, a total of eight kilobytes uh, in, in size. So this gives you a sense that you can actually, to some extent, directly control this if you know the right way to talk to the operating system about it. A lot of this stuff happens behind the scenes through manipulations of the stack and the heap uh, without you need to manually intervene. But if the need arises, you can actually make use of MMAP to do this. And this is how you would build a full-on implementation in the modern era of something like uh, malloc, that a malloc system needs some space to operate. And so here, at some spot that follows 
the text and global area of a program, you would ma M map in some space for the start of the heap. And as you would need to grow it, uh, you ran out of the first page, for instance, uh, then you M map another page on. This allows you to grow the virtual memory space associated with the heap uh, and facilitate larger and larger malics. This is how modern systems tend to do it, although there's some historical precedent uh, associated with this uh, S Burke or Burke point uh, down here uh, that was an older style of doing things before virtual memory took over. Uh, the last thing that we should talk about then is uh, these guys, uh, which are also conspicuous, uh, not just because they have interesting looking names, but also because their sizes are quite large. Uh, as evidenced by the diagram that we examined before, uh, where this shared memory area where dynamic libraries exist, these things are tend to be where the definitions for uh, the library code that you're going to use uh, are mapped in. Now, uh, library code is tends to be executable as well, and so a very strong candidate here uh, for where the where uh, the definition of printf is located uh, is probably this uh, block that starts at 007fd, etc. Uh, that is quite large, but uh, conspicuously marked as executable. I'd expect there in the libc, as in the C standard library, to find definitions for some of our favorite functions, uh, your malloc's, your printf's, your freeze, uh, your fprintf's, etc., etc. All the stuff that makes uh, C programming somewhat easier uh, than it would be otherwise is probably linked in here. Importantly, the fact that this looks sort of like it's owned by this program is only half of the story, because despite this be a virtual address appearing in the program image and mapping uh, to this uh, location associated with libc, it's very likely that there are a lot of other programs that similarly have some virtual memory image over here that's mapping to this same libc. It's a single physical location, but since all those programs can only read or execute the stuff that's there, uh, then it's easily shareable by everybody without stepping on any other's, uh, other's foots. Uh, it's the case that most library functions, uh, for instance, printf, need some data associated with it. So it can be the case that there's some private data that's mapped in associated with the C library uh, that would be used for buffers, for instance, uh, for printf and so forth, uh, that part of the shared library business is to detect this is the part I can share, but everybody who makes use of this needs its own little private area down here that's marked uh, read write and is therefore not safe to share. So every program that's running will get a copy of that stuff uh, for its own. Uh, to that end then, uh, this libc business is important in that every program that's running probably has a link to this or similar spot in memory and therefore reduces the need for every program to have its own copy of printf. Uh, tremendously useful. Uh, the other things that show up in this arena, then, uh, are the LD program. Uh, this is an important program that we may get some time to talk about. It's, it's the dynamic loader, and it is responsible for taking a program from its disk image and loading it into memory, along with linking in any shared libraries that are needed by it. Importantly, one of the things that LD has done is to link in uh, the shared C library here. Finally, both of these are marked with this .so extension, uh, and this is significant because it's uh, short for shared object. In order for things like this to be compiled and then dynamic loaded and shared, they tend to have a slightly different format than your run-of-the-mill executable. Uh, to that end, if there's time, we'll talk a little bit about what those differences look like and how you can facilitate not just statically linked code where you copy definitions from one file to the other, uh, but dynamically linked code where the executable that you produce isn't complete, it needs some additional things at load time. Finally, then there's an odd bugger in here, uh, Gettysburg, uh, and this is where we got by memory mapping this file over here. Uh, the location that we specified associated with Get Gettysburg was a null, uh, and that's mentioned here as the first argument, uh, as in I don't have a preference uh, operating system where you plop down uh, the image that you map for Gettysburg for me. So the operating system chose one sort of in the midst of all of this stuff. You'll notice that uh, in some cases the operating system can determine uh, this is where the stack uh, is for this program, but there's no mention of this thing as uh, uh, the heap potentially. And in truth, several of the things that are in here could be heap 
memory. Uh, hard to say exactly uh, what it is. And I wouldn't ask you in an exam setting, uh, for instance, uh, to identify uh, specifically what each of these things are, uh, but to speculate in some cases. Uh, for instance, where would you expect the printf definition to be? Uh, savvy folks will look around and see that since in my own program I did not define what printf is, this is probably going to be in some library function, not in the text associated with memory parts. Uh, and this libc is a likely candidate for that, particularly because it's marked as executable here. Now, I'm not going to be able to answer other more refined questions like what is this weird executable block that's way at the end of the memory images? Uh, and why is there this tremendously high thing up here that's marked executable only? For those, you would probably will need to look in some more detail at the Linux architecture uh, specifically to see how it does its business to load programs in and get them running. But for the moment, uh, this should sort of suffice uh, to, to, to indicate what's going on here. One other interesting aspect that I wanted to point out, and uh, I'll finally end this poor memory parts program that's been sitting around and waiting for me to punch a key, is so I ran this program again, what you'll see is that the memory addresses here, they follow the same general pattern. Uh, that main shows up earliest, but the specific addresses are actually different. Uh, that main here started at OX55. Here it starts at OX, uh, OX56. Uh, down here, I asked specifically for this location OX600 every time and have gotten it in both cases, though no guarantees on that part. But just about every other part of this, uh, including, uh, for instance, the mmapped file, uh, the malloc array, uh, and so forth, these all have different addresses. This is a modern innovation that we discussed somewhat earlier on that improves the security of a system by uh, randomizing to some extent the virtual memory addresses at which these things start out, uh, it makes it much harder for an attacker uh, to manipulate programs through nefarious means. Uh, one of the common ways to do this used to be to overflow a buffer, uh, as in right off the end of array, uh, and thereby manipulate the return address associated with a function. Uh, at that point, then, you could, with careful engineering, uh, architect a particular address to show up in memory uh, so that as this function returns and something is pulled off the stack, you can get the program to go to a function it wouldn't normally go to through the return functionality. Uh, this is harder if the function you're trying to get at is constantly moving around through this address space manipulation and randomization. Uh, it calls for a virtual memory system that supports it, where you can you know, map things uh, uh, in, in this way. And it also calls for a certain invariance uh, to be met. And what we'll find is that despite these two addresses moving around, uh, we'll see that, for instance, the distance, as in if you subtracted off the address of this global array, which is higher in memory, subtracted off main, it'll be the same exact quantity as if you subtracted it off here. And this is to facilitate uh, then access to global variables in text using that uh, rip relative addressing we talked about way back in our assembly discussion. And it leads to then both the security and relative efficiency uh, by using some special addressing mechanisms. All right, I think that's enough uh, sort of dwelling on this PMAP utility. Uh, it's a tremendously informative little utility, uh, and there's a dense amount of information here. Uh, as you would seek to understand the memory footprint associated with programs, it's a useful one to understand. But some things are obscured, and that if you counted up these, all these pages that are mapped in, you might try to conclude that this is the total memory that's being used by this program. That wouldn't necessarily be a fair way to uh, sort of assess this against a program, though, because in truth, it's not the only thing that is using these large blocks of memory associated with the C library. There are probably a lot of other programs that are mapping to this thing, and they are all using the same physical spots, so the total memory image isn't really uh, associated with this uh, 4200K or so. Uh, and so too, this Gettysburg thing is going to be cached as a file in the operating system space as well. Even if you hadn't memory mapped it, it would be being used as memory by the operating system. And the fact that you have a pointer to it here uh, directly uh, does not really or shouldn't really count against your total memory footprint uh, in this case. So uh, this lends some richness then to uh, this mystery that is created by the virtual memory system where uh, you're never sure exactly where anything is, but in truth it doesn't matter too much on that front because most modern operating systems and hardware take care of that business for you. 
we talked just briefly about protections associated with uh, memory uh, and I wanted to point out again over here uh, that these permissions should be familiar to you as you have worked with files in Unix systems. R for read, W for writes, and X for execute. In the context of files, an X would mean an executable program. In the context of memory, it means that this particular page contains instructions that can be executed. Uh, through memory mapping, you can actually make requests uh, that you map in things as readable only, readable and writable, writable only, not sure you'd, why you'd want that, uh, but there's also an execute in permission uh, that's important uh, to know about. As you would be mapping in, for instance, uh, the first part of this program, if you're writing a loader, you want to load it in as executable so you could actually run the main function that it is present in there. Uh, if not, uh, for instance, if you try to read some memory uh, that is not readable, try to write to a memory that is not writable uh, or try to execute memory that is not executable uh, then you'll get essentially a segmentation violation uh, based on permissions as in you're trying not to do something with memory that you're not supposed to uh, finally then uh, there's one other little bit over here associated with this Gettysburg file by passing in certain options you can actually get uh, sharing associated with pages of memory in the context of mapping files, this means your changes will be shared with the operating system. And to that end, uh, we talked about that as meaning as you would change stuff in this Gettysburg uh, file, then you would uh, actually be, be making permanent changes uh, to that file. Uh, when we looked at this earlier in terms of uh, the shell output over here, uh, I had passed a different set of options so the Gettysburg over here doesn't have that S permission associated with it. It would be a simple change to adjust that in the homework. You just need to come in here uh, to this uh, business over here and tack on an uh, uh, option to this uh, mmap over here uh, and tack on that map shared option and that would bring forth the S that you see over here. So uh, that I think more or less wraps us up in terms of the virtual memory system, some of the tools and techniques and utilities that are associated with it. This last slide contains a few good review questions that you might want to have a look at as you seek to solidify your understanding of virtual memory uh, in preparation for our final exam, which is some ways off at this point, but never too early uh, to start uh, preparing there. On our next meeting this Friday, we'll begin discussion of the linker and ELF file formats. The ELF file format or executable and linkable format is the standard executable and object file format used on most Unix systems, uh, barring Mac OS X, which has its own file format for that. But you see it just about everywhere on Linux systems. Uh, as the name implies, it's meant to be used for executable programs and object files that are to be crammed together to become executable code at some point. Uh, tied up in that then is discussion also of how the virtual memory system can allow for sharing of library code. I hope that you join me then. Until we meet online or elsewhere, hope everyone is healthy and happy hacking.